I was staring at my computer screen when she walked into the room. She had been coming home late from work for a long time now. Today was different. It was almost 10 o'clock. The kids and I had already eaten dinner and done their homework. They had already been in bed for almost an hour. They hadn't even asked about mom or why she wasn't home. This had only recently happened and it was making me sad. I had spent the last hour analyzing our finances. Things have deteriorated dramatically over the past two years. Our income had decreased significantly, but my wife didn't notice it. She was still spending money freely as if we didn't care. I just finished paying the last of the bills. We might be able to get by for a couple more months. I was reviewing my life plan, too. I may have made a mistake. For the past two years, I've been looking at a time bomb, wondering if it would ever go off. I always assumed it would someday, but now I was beginning to doubt it. I don't know how long she stood there looking at me. Lately, I had been immersed in my own thoughts more and more. The loss of time was a byproduct. Finally, crossing her arms and with an all-too-familiar look of contempt on her face, she spoke. Michael, I want a divorce. I don't know how I felt at that moment. My spirit was so overwhelmed with doubt and self-loathing that I was almost numb to the new emotions. It wasn't really all that funny, but I still tried to suppress a laugh. My wife, who I had been with for 17 years, had just told me that it was over between us, that everything we had built together was finally going to be destroyed. I hadn't felt that kind of emotion in a long time, and it almost made me smile. Relief. I stared at her for just a moment, allowing myself to be transported back to our happy times one last time. Then I snapped back to reality. Okay. I was a better programmer than I was a manager. Unfortunately, programmers get promoted to project managers, then to department heads, and then to senior management. That's how I ended up as a senior product development manager. It was just a fancy title for a salesperson. In fact, at the time, I was the most qualified for the position. I pretty much single-handedly created our flagship product line. I nurtured it in its infancy, helped it grow through six consecutive updates. I knew our product better than anyone. When customers had questions, I had answers. When our employees had problems, I knew how to solve them. Add to that a new haircut and an expensive suit, and I definitely looked appropriate. The increased salary and benefits that came along with my promotion were for naught. I would say I was mostly happy with my job, but I loved programming and really missed it. In my position, I didn't have the opportunity to do it. There were too many meetings and phone calls to allow myself the luxury of getting back to lines of code. I was forced to watch a new batch of young, wild-eyed guys trying to outdo each other with their latest developments. I'm not going to lie. Being the boss was worth it, but I always wished my job description was a little different. It was no surprise that I was fired from Chicago Technology Solutions. If I had been responsible for myself, I would have done the same thing. I attended meetings sporadically at best and missed deadlines far too often. At the time, I was not trying to get fired, but I really made no attempt to keep my job at CTS. I was depressed for a long time. It took me almost three months to get out of my initial depressed state and try to move forward. But even that proved to be a miserable failure. It took another month to find a way out of the predicament I was in, at least one that I could live with. I think I would have lost my mind if I didn't have kids. They had a flawless routine that helped me get my life back on a positive track. Breakfast, school, noon, afternoon, snack, homework, dinner, bed. Breakfast, school, noon, homework, dinner, bed. This was my mantra, and it helped me find my way. I dove headfirst into my work to be a stay-at-home dad. I took over all the household and cab duties. The kids genuinely enjoyed my presence in the house. It allowed me to realize that I had some value. I wasn't completely worthless. If my wife sensed this change in our family dynamic, she never spoke of it. I'm pretty sure she didn't even notice it. I met Jennifer Riley at a fraternity party. I had almost decided not to go. I joined the fraternity for the doors it would open after graduation, not to attend parties while I was in school. I figured I would need all the help I could get. My grades were excellent, so that wasn't a concern. However, everything else about me was just average. Height, weight, looks, personality. Average. My name, Michael, was the most popular name from 1961 to 1988. Totally average. Honestly, when I was away from the computer, there was nothing so unique about me. Dates? I had a few. Relationships? Well, not that many. Even in my senior year of college, I was pretty good at keeping myself company. Until I met Jennifer Riley. 
Jennifer was almost as average as I was. I realized that the average woman looked a lot better. She was a little withdrawn. I watched her for quite a while before I worked up the courage to talk to her. Our first meeting was short and quiet, but the acquaintance was made. Over the next few weeks, we met for coffee and studied together at the library. Before our first real date, we socialized for almost two months. From that point on, it was the most fantastic time of my life. Fifteen years of bliss. Our courtship was short, and our engagement was even shorter. Shortly after graduation, we were married and settled into our first apartment in Chicago. We rode the same train morning and evening to and from our first job. We were barely making ends meet, but we were together. We had almost everything in common. Family histories, dating experiences, common interests and goals. Where we didn't match, we matched. If I wasn't good at something, Jennifer made it happen. If she had a flaw, it was one of my strengths. I was better at managing our joint finances. Jennifer was better at managing our social and family schedules. We worked together, and our lives quickly began to get better. Over the next few years, we were both promoted several times. Our group of friends expanded considerably. We were able to save up money to buy our first home while still traveling and having fun. Our relationship progressed slowly. The first one lasted until the night of our engagement. Jennifer quit her job after eight years when our son Jacob was born. A little over a year later, our daughter Emily came along. Yes, I know their names were the most popular when they were born. It was kind of a family tradition. We bought a three-bedroom house in the suburbs that had room for a dog. We bought a family sedan and a minivan. All in all, our life was working out pretty well. Two kids, a pet, a house, and two cars. A perfectly average life. I didn't think I could be any happier. I was wrong. My promotion to manager came shortly after Emily's first birthday. Afterward, I felt like I had been rewarded for years of being ignored as one of the average masses and not complaining. Like I said, my new salary was nothing to sneeze at, and we didn't. I had a flexible schedule, working from home most of the day, traveling to the office for staff and management meetings. They say money can't buy happiness. I believe that to be true. But what you can buy is stylish clothes and grooming, better health care, a new home in a better neighborhood, and self-confidence. I went from average to just above average. My wife went from average, who I thought was beautiful, to slightly above average, who I thought was damn beautiful. Our life, which I always thought was good, reached a new level. We started traveling more and spending time with our kids, saving more and more money for retirement. When Emily went to elementary school, Jennifer decided she wanted to go back to working part-time. She quickly found a job she thought she would enjoy at a startup marketing firm. She would head to the office when she took the kids to school. Her workday would end when it was time to pick up the kids. That was the icing on the cake. We didn't need her salary and we were able to save it. I projected that by the time the kids graduated from college, we would be able to retire and live very comfortably. I found out my wife was cheating on me by accident three months before our 15th wedding anniversary. It was my birthday. I actually found proof two days before my birthday. I just didn't know it. It took me a few weeks to piece it all together. I hadn't given much thought to the fact that my wife wanted to take a more active role in her new job. It meant that she would be working a few more hours a week and I would have to pick up the kids from school. But it didn't affect my schedule in any way, and I was happy about that. When after about three months I noticed that she was often distracted, I asked her about it. She replied that she was trying to find herself in the office and was a little stressed. I decided to take on more responsibilities around the house to lighten her load a bit. When our lives went downhill, we talked about it. She said she was getting older and she didn't need to have fun like a bunny anymore. For a few weeks, our life perked up, but then it went down again. I hesitated to broach the subject again for fear of a fight. I was almost at my wit's end when I discovered the present. The weather had cooled considerably, and I was looking for one of my sweaters. I had taken over laundry duties, and more than once I got confused as to which closet the clothes should be in. I was going through the sweaters on the shelf of her closet when I saw it behind some old shoe boxes. It was hard to miss. The pink box and white ribbon from the lingerie store was unmistakable. The postcard addressed to Beloved had me enthralled. A small war of thoughts erupted in my head for a moment. Should I look at it or wait? I decided to watch. I wasn't sure I could wait until my birthday. Please excuse the wrapping this gift came in. You can unwrap the real gift on your birthday when I wear what's in the box. Love, Jennifer. Over the next 48 hours, I stepped up my game. 
I made sure to meet her at the door with flowers, give her a foot massage, and cook her favorite dinner. Her reaction was not what I expected. It was as if she tolerated my caresses. On my birthday, I made sure the kids finished their homework early. I didn't want any problems to interfere with my present. I was a little surprised when Jennifer got home late from work. I was even more confused when she asked what I was having for dinner. But I was willing to play along to get her my surprise. I said we should go out for pizza. The kids nodded approvingly and we hit the road. Michael huddled with the waitress, and just before we left, the waiters wished me a happy birthday. I thought I saw surprise in my wife's eyes, but she quickly recovered. I'll give you a present later, Michael, she said, smiling. The ride home was a stressful one for me. I almost got into a car accident. The 15 minutes waiting for the kids to get ready for bed was brutal, and the 15 minutes afterward when they fell asleep was excruciating. Thankfully, Jennifer returned from an emergency trip to the store for milk shortly after they fell asleep. When I got to the bedroom door, Jennifer wasn't in the room. I sat down on the bed. A few minutes later, she came out of the bathroom wearing a flannel nightgown, no makeup on her face, and her hair gathered in a ponytail. By now, I was starting to get frustrated with the games. When was I going to get my present? She slid into bed and climbed under the covers. She reached up to turn off the bedroom lamp, but stopped. Oh, I almost forgot. She opened the nightstand drawer and pulled out a small square box wrapped in the colorful balloon paper we'd used at Michael's last birthday party and held it out to me. Happy birthday, darling. And that was the end of it. She rolled over onto her back, turned off the light, and fell asleep. I was too shocked to even open her present. The next day, I became depressed. I replayed the events of the day over and over in my head and couldn't figure out what I had done that had so obviously ruined our evening. I was at a complete loss. For almost two weeks, I had been wallowing in my own despair. That damn present was practically flashing me a pink light, heralding my failure. I've heard all the cliches. The husband is the last to know and so on. I have to be honest and admit that I really was in the dark. The thought of Jennifer cheating on me was so foreign that I never once considered the possibility. But it was the first thing that came to my mind when she called home 13 days after my birthday to let me know she'd be home late. It's Alan's 30th birthday and the staff is going out to celebrate. I might be late. I don't remember what I replied to her as I walked over to my bedroom closet but I do remember looking at the empty space where my present once lay. I also remember the horrible chest pain and vomiting in the bathroom. For longer than I care to admit, I thought I might have a heart attack, and for a few moments I hoped it was true, and that I would die soon. Alan Henderson was Jennifer's boss, a slick and scraggly advertising executive who was a few years younger than Jennifer and me. I'd only met him once, but I remember not liking him very much, mostly because he seemed so insincere when he spoke. It was Emily who brought me to my senses. Are you okay, Daddy? It took a few seconds before my gaze focused on my daughter, who hovered over me on the verge of tears. I'm fine, sweetie. Daddy just ate something his stomach didn't like. I'll be out in a minute. I just need to clean myself up. I eventually managed to get out of the bathroom, though I don't remember much afterward. I only remember grabbing my dusty bottle of scotch. Judging by the headache the next morning, I knew I'd had a few drinks. I had no idea when Jennifer got home. When I found her in the kitchen feeding the kids that morning, she didn't look like anything unusual had happened. She was just going about her usual business. It was only the slight shudder I saw on her face when she sat down to eat that killed any remaining love in me. It was very subtle, but it was so true. I wish I had written about how I stood up to my cheating wife. But I didn't. I was just devastated. It was all I could do to move. And for weeks, I didn't get better. I was like a zombie. Every day that I realized that my wife was sitting at home carefree, I got worse and worse. I felt like I had hit rock bottom. It wasn't until my 15th wedding anniversary that I shook myself up and decided to take action. I probably wouldn't have done anything. I was being a wimp. I knew that. I wish I could say I was in shock. There is probably some technical psychological terminology to my behavior. If my father were alive, he would simply say that I was acting like a wuss. And he would have been right. It wasn't until my wife announced that she had to go to a work conference that the fog lifted from my thoughts. She would be gone during our anniversary. I don't know why that mattered to me. It was just another level of disrespect. But it hurt me, 
mostly because she hadn't made it clear in any way that she even knew about the date. After drinking myself into oblivion the night of our anniversary, I woke up angry. I'd reached my limit. I called my lawyer and made an appointment. I was going to end this farce. I was sure my life couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. The attitude I walked into the lawyer's office with was replaced with crushing disbelief. I knew divorce could be difficult. I thought my wife's adultery would work in my favor. Instead, the lawyer was punching hole after hole in my case. I didn't have any evidence of cheating. If I had proof, it wouldn't have mattered. My wife would have been entitled to a 50-50th split of our assets. I had no proof that my wife was a bad parent. Joint custody would have been the best hope. The income difference also worked in my wife's favor. I would pay spousal maintenance and alimony. My wife would likely have gotten primary custody and the right to remain in the home for the benefit of the children. My wife was a cheating whore and I was a cheating buffoon. I went from depression to confusion. My whore even asked me about it a few weeks later. You really don't look well, Michael. Is something bothering you? No, honey. At least she pretended to care. And I was just wandering through life. Then I got fired. I didn't know it at the time, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was the evening news that gave me a glimmer of hope. I watched depressing story after depressing story, and they seemed to fit my mood quite well. But then this happened. A major employer on the East Coast went bankrupt. Former employees were scrambling to get their last paychecks and worried about their pensions. It seemed to me that some people might be in a worse position than I was. Then the talking head reappeared on the screen with his analysis. Employees would likely win a lawsuit against their former employer, but it wouldn't matter. There's nothing left. All the money is gone. It didn't take me long to connect the dots and form the basics of the plan. My wife couldn't take what wasn't there. We wouldn't have anything, so we wouldn't share anything. Of course, in doing so, I was getting myself worked up, but I was already going to lose half of it. So did I really care about the rest? My plan started out simple enough. I was unemployed and I wasn't going to look for a job. I was going to spend our savings until there was nothing left. Admittedly, it was a reckless idea. Even I didn't think it would work. But it was something I could hold on to. Two years is a long time. I was excruciatingly bored when I was alone, which was most of the time. I realized that Jennifer really was the lifeblood of our friendship group. When she became estranged from me, I discovered that I had no really strong friendships. I was an only child. Both of my parents died young, my dad from a heart attack and my mom from cancer. I was truly alone. I know that a detailed account of how I lived my life would be boring to you. I can easily summarize my life by saying it was horrible. For two years, my children were the only right thing in my life. I had never spent money on anything extra before. I still kept receipts for everything I bought. I started withdrawing small amounts of cash each week and saving it up. After about two months, it came to my attention that we weren't spending money fast enough to make a difference. Apparently, I was good at saving money and not so good at spending it. So I stepped up my game and made some adjustments to my original plan. I enrolled in an executive MBA program. The university was expensive but local. I spent almost $120,000 at one time. I paid cash for a new luxury SUV, $60,000 out the window. I fully funded the children's educational savings accounts. That took another $260,000. I spent thousands on a new closet and started withdrawing more and more cash twice a week. I'd drop the kids off at school, hit the bank, and head to the lakeshore. I never gambled with the money I took with me. A few bucks here and there to amuse myself in some way. I spent enough to show I spent the day at the casino, including checks for lunch, snacks, and parking. The bulk of the money was going into the wall safe in our garage. My personal post-divorce war chest in case things went south. My other expensive purchase? Permanent private surveillance of my wife and her lover. I asked for everything I needed, video, photos, a daily diary of events. I'm ashamed to say how much it cost me. You're probably wondering if my wife noticed any of my spending? I would say yes, with the exception of gambling. I had to tell her about how I was transferring money to the kids because I needed her signature on the custodial accounts. She saw my car and clothes. She never said anything about them. I'm sure she thought I was working and that we still lived on Easy Street. She made a few purchases too, but I never said a word. I've often wondered who benefits from her buying lingerie more often. We just never discussed the subject. We were cordial with each other and communicated daily. 
It was like we each tolerated a roommate we didn't particularly like. Sex? Don't even think about it. Spending time with my kids was the highlight of my existence. I did my best to support whatever interests they had. We did homework and played games together. We went to parks, rode bikes, and went to the movies. Since I took on the role of home cook, they seemed to be interested in helping me. I found some easy recipes and let them do it. Jennifer usually showed up sometime during the week. I didn't exclude her from our family time, but I didn't try to involve her in it either. If she was around and wanted to participate, she simply did so without saying a word to me. I received a weekly report of my wife's activities. I thought she was just having fun with her boss, but it was actually a few guys from her office. After a few months, the company's clients showed up on her dance card. Did it hurt? Not really. I already thought she was a slut. The fact that I now had proof didn't hurt me one bit. It wasn't a very interesting read. In a way, I was relieved, but not by much. It was clear that Alan Henderson was not a very skillful lover, although he had the ability to spread his gifts among several different women. This surprised me somewhat. I had assumed, based on her gift, that he and my slut had some sort of relationship, but really they were more like idiot buddies. She just let him have it. It was the same with most of the other six men. But there was one client, a little nerd with glasses and pocket protector to cement his geek status, who really let Jennifer have it. The photos and video were too grainy to tell if she liked it, but it looked pretty painful to me. Despite classes, kids, and gambling, I had a lot of free time on my hands. So I decided to focus on my life after marriage, which I assumed would come someday. I started working out. I had always been in decent shape, but certainly nothing special. During that time, I made some good gains in bench press and endurance running. I believe that huge muscles and good looks are mostly genetics, and I clearly didn't fit either of those categories. However, personally, I was very happy with the way I looked. I started researching the latest news about my former industry. I decided that at some point I was going to need a job. A year away from the madness had left me far behind, as far as I was concerned. I spent several hours each day learning about the latest technology and software packages. I was particularly interested in my old company CTS. They seemed to be stagnant. They were definitely not losing market share. Their revenues were stable, but they were not gaining momentum. In the technology business, if you stand still, you lose. I also spent a significant amount of time studying divorce. Some of my time was spent devising new cunning plans to ruin my hopefully soon-to-be ex-wife's life. Most of my time, however, has been spent studying how divorce affects children. I had already gone through most of my pain, and the kids played a big part in that. I wanted to make sure that when their transition came, I would be fully prepared. There is a lot of information out there that I thought was complete nonsense. It was another eight months into my adventure when I started to panic. My wife started coming home at regular times. She started talking to me and asking me how my day was. I answered curtly, of course, but she didn't seem to be embarrassed by that. She began to dress more defiantly for bed. It seemed like she was trying to revive the intimacy of our former life. A few weeks later, things got even worse. For a year and a half, she had not been involved in our relationship and was minding her own business. Now she was complaining about the lack of communication. She started talking about working on our marriage. And I stopped talking to her. Complete silence. Her attempts at reconciliation continued until her birthday. I left her gift on the dining room table. The wrapping paper should have looked familiar to me since I had used it for the last gift she had given me. The contents shouldn't have been a surprise either. Six months passed before I opened the last present I received from my wife for my birthday. It was a watch with a cheap digital dial. When I spotted my birthday gift in the impulse buying section of our neighborhood convenience store, I was pretty pissed. A $9.95 watch from a convenience store. Goddamn bitch. When I saw they had a matching women's model, I calmed down. I bought them and waited 18 months to give them to her. I wish I could have seen her reaction, but alas, I wasn't around when she opened them. The kids and I had an emergency movie night and got home pretty late. She was gone before the kids, and I even got up the next day. Suddenly, everything was back to normal. Jennifer started staying at the office more and more often. We barely spoke when she was home. And finally, she said, Michael, I want a divorce. I hoped she'd get it over with quickly but it took almost a week before I was handed her application. It was almost laughable. Spousal and child support, unequal distribution of property in her favor, 
mental and emotional abuse listed as relevant factors. I waited until the following Monday before taking the kids camping. I didn't want them around when I let the hounds out. We returned six days later, rested and refreshed. Jennifer was waiting for us at home. She was sitting alone in the living room. I think she might have had the stomach flu. At any rate, she didn't look well. I wondered what detail was the biggest surprise to me. I had filed for divorce on grounds of adultery. I asked for the house, the only real property we had left, and full custody of the children. I asked for spousal and child support because I was unemployed and had two years of full-time childcare. I filed attachment alienation lawsuits against Jennifer's seven partners. I was under no illusions that I would win any of them, but Illinois law allowed me to do so, so I came back armed. I filed civil suits against her employer and the companies of the three clients who were taking advantage of my wife's prostitute status. Again, I didn't think I could win, but the notoriety might have worked in my favor. Finally, I sent a DVD of Jennifer's greatest hits to her parents and best friend so she would know I wasn't afraid to take advantage of it. She needed to know about the evidence I had against her. It was all listed in my countersuit, but I didn't want to take any chances. The children had a snack and went to their rooms to get ready for bed. They paid no attention to their mother. She made no move to address them. I walked over to the refrigerator to grab a beer. Then I made my way to the living room and sank into the chair across from Jennifer. She didn't look at me for a long time. I was just enjoying my beer. Besides not feeling well, she seemed to be crying about something. Maybe she was hurt? Eventually she spoke, but almost in a whisper. You're going to ruin me. I waited for her to look up to see the look in her eyes when I answered. It took a few seconds. God, I hope so. I thought this moment would be more intense. When a single tear appeared in her eye and rolled down her cheek, I felt nothing. Do you hate me that much? Oh no, Jennifer. I don't hate you. Hating takes effort. I can honestly say that I put in absolutely no effort when it comes to you. All my effort goes into taking care of me and my children. But I'm your wife. Stop. I'm not going to let a piece of shit like you sully my wife's good name. My wife was a loving and caring woman, my best friend, my partner, and the mother of my children. She's dead. And you're the whore who took over her body. Don't talk like you have anything to do with me. It was a long time before she spoke again. What am I supposed to do now? Is that a rhetorical question or do you really want my answer? I didn't let her answer before continuing. I suppose there are several options to solve your predicament. You could go far, far away and try to start a new life. That would be the option I would choose. I will never let my kids spend any meaningful time with you, so it shouldn't affect your decision to leave in any way. Or I suppose you could try staying here. Hang around town, try to keep your head up. But who knows who'll hear about your little exploits or who'll want to hire a damn whore like you. Maybe you'll get attached to some loser who doesn't care that you're a whore. But what kind of loser would that be? Or you could kill yourself. I really hope you don't choose that option. It would deprive me of watching you suffer like the bitch you are. But then again, I'm not sure my opinion matters to a bitch like you. It certainly didn't matter when you decided to start having fun with your boss. I'd been dreaming of giving this speech for months. I should have been excited about the opportunity to give it. Watching word by word as whatever was left of her spirit crumbled, I hoped I'd get some satisfaction. But instead, I felt an emptiness. Life after the divorce has been ambiguous. Things were going much better with the lawsuits than I had hoped. I received a little over a million dollars in compensation from three companies whose employees slept with my wife. This was surprising because my lawyer told me not to expect much. During the post-match analysis, we decided that after he dealt with my ex-wife's company, they wouldn't want to engage in negative publicity. We destroyed my ex-wife's company through discovery motions, depositions, and leaks to the press. I also started my own covert campaign, emailing the CEOs of their remaining clients with information about my wife, her boss, and their buddies. Do you really want to be in bed with this company when the shit hits the fan? It took a while, but gradually their revenue dried up. Employees who didn't want to be associated with the scandal quit. Eventually, they filed for bankruptcy. Alan Henderson was fired and left town in disgrace. The $200,000 check I received was smaller than my other victories, but much more satisfying. I got nothing from the foreclosure of attachment lawsuits. I didn't think I would get any. However, four wives and subsequent divorces took their husbands out. 
it wasn't all champagne and roses. In the process, I got hurt myself. It was not uncommon for me to run into someone who was familiar with my situation. The taunts and teasing got out of hand for a while. I don't know if it was fortunately or unfortunately, but I didn't care. I already felt like a loser, so someone else's words didn't move me. Some of those bastards were actually pretty smart. I was able to keep my kids safe from most of the side effects. That had always been my main concern. They were sad for a while, but soon recovered. The biggest victory was my return to CTS as Vice President of Design and Development. One way to take my mind off my personal turmoil was to return to programming. In two confusing years, I was able to develop an add-on to the core CTS software that allowed it to easily integrate with two other popular competitor software packages. I started my own company and began selling my development. Less than a year later, I received offers from all three companies to buy my company and my software. I received $11 million for my company and an incredible compensation package from CTS. I had been considering retirement for some time, but due to my complete lack of a social life, I was sure I would become a recluse if I didn't give myself a reason to get out of the house every day. My new income allowed me to hire a sweet old lady to serve as housekeeper and babysitter for the children. A year later, Mrs. Marlene Jensen moved in with us full-time, settling into an apartment above the garage in our new house. She was like a grandmother to my children, mostly sweet and kind, but strict when needed. What I valued most was the advice she could give my children, the kind that only comes through the wisdom of experience. I loved my children and did my best to be a caring and attentive father. But I was also spoiled, jaded, and cruel. I also looked to her for advice. She was my rock when it came time to make decisions. The children grew up and became adults, and I saw them and their families from time to time. Unfortunately, as time went on, our closeness waned. I did not resent them in any way. It was better to keep me at a distance so that my bitterness would not affect their lives. Mrs. Jensen worked for me until the kids went off to college. Then she retired. I offered her free room and board as a pension. She was a constant presence in my life for 15 years. She tried her best to get me to live again and find someone to share my life with. I appreciated her efforts, but eventually she died knowing that I would always be alone. I never opened up to anyone else. My friendships were shallow and not fulfilling. I never went on dates except for a few group dinners organized by random friends. I developed a well-deserved reputation as an icy, ruthless bastard who was not to be crossed. For the most part, I was shunned, and I blamed no one but myself for that. My ever-growing wealth allowed me to maintain a constant rotation of call girls. I paid generously for their time. Mostly, I just sent them out the door. But there was one I really liked. Her name was Candy. Later, I found out it was actually Mary Beth. I guess I was more than just a customer to her, too. But I could never burden someone else with my demons, so when I felt she was getting too attached to me, I cut her loose. If you're wondering what happened to Jennifer, she had a hard life. She tried to talk to me for almost a year. I don't know why she tried. Did she think we could reconcile, or was she hoping for a relationship with my children? Maybe. I gave her fair warning, but she didn't listen. She tried to stay in Chicago, and I started following her. When she applied for jobs, I made sure her employment history was always in plain sight. When she started dating, which was almost immediately, I sent packages to her potential partners with information about the woman they were letting into their lives. I didn't care if they wanted to keep her around after they learned the truth, but I didn't want her to be able to twist history by ignoring it. I had to live with it every day, so it was only fair that she had to as well. Like I said, my ex-wife continued a constant campaign of unanswered phone calls, emails I never read or responded to, and always kept my email inbox full. I think some sick part of me wanted her to suffer for a while at least. I suppose early on it would have been appropriate to seek professional help. Perhaps it would have saved some part of my soul and allowed me to get back on track. But in the end, I never went, and as time went on, it began to feel like it was too late to do anything about it. I could have changed my phone number, but I didn't. The assistant could have sorted my mail, but I always did it myself. I could have blocked her incoming emails. That would have prevented me from accidentally opening one of them. It was a stream of apologies that meant nothing. Of course, the situation was out of control. She had always loved me. Hadn't she suffered enough? I responded with a gift and a simple note. I bought lingerie from her favorite store and carefully wrapped it in a sheer white ribbon that really accentuated the pink of the box. I enclosed a beautifully handwritten note. I'm sure she appreciated the symmetry when she opened the card addressed to bitch. 
I hope she understood the meaning of my words. I thought the inscription, go screw you, was a pretty clear indication. Actually, there was a rougher expression there, but I'll be polite to you. One of her potential suitors was trying to hold me accountable for tormenting my ex-wife. He showed up on my doorstep, full of liquid courage, shoved me back and knocked me off my feet as I opened the front door. It was his mistake. As I've said before, I'm nothing special. I had no martial arts or special forces training. I was just a regular guy. I was never violent. Hell, I'd never even been in a fight. But what I did have was rage, undiluted, unspent hatred for my wife and her lovers. He was the unfortunate recipient of my exit. I ended up with a nice bump and a broken rib. He was lucky to be alive. He pleaded guilty to misdemeanor assault and trespassing and got probation as a first-time offender. I think the years of reconstructive surgery and rehabilitation made a bigger impression on him. Jennifer never tried to contact me again. I stopped following her after another year when she found a steady job cleaning rooms at a traveling hotel in a town about 700 miles away in the backwoods of Virginia. The only time I saw her was 16 years later at my daughter's wedding. I know that the children met Jennifer again a few years after graduating from college. I made no attempt to stop them from finding her. The years have not been kind to her. She had gained at least 20 pounds, had deep wrinkles around her lips and other signs of smoking. This was a new phenomenon. Overall, she looked old and haggard. But underneath it all, I still saw the woman I had given my heart to. I felt nothing for her, but I saw her. She was sitting alone in the bridal church near the back wall. Her interaction with my daughter was brief, cordial, but detached. She made no attempt to speak to me. For the rest of the evening, we never came within 30 feet of each other. She was standing outside waiting for a cab. When I saw the ring on her finger, I smiled for the first time in a long time. Maybe she had it better than I did, judging by the small gold ring and the paltry diamond on the ring finger of her left hand. I walked over to her and stared at it for a few moments. When I raised my head and met her eyes, a deep sadness was read in her gaze. By the way, you ruined my life first. I looked at her left hand, then back into her eyes. I'm glad you found someone. I hope he makes you happy. I walked quickly to my car. My driver was already waiting attentively for me. Good evening, Mr. Smith. I hope you had a pleasant evening, sir. Are we going to the club? It went as well as I could have hoped, Jonathan. Let's go straight back to the house. I think I should like to be alone tonight. Of course, sir. As we pulled away, I tried my best not to look back, but I caught a brief glimpse of her. Goodbye. Michael Smith was not a handsome man. There was nothing remarkable about him at first glance, but he was very sweet, nice to look at, and smart, and he was different from other guys. Our first meeting happened on probably the worst night of my college life. My sorority sisters dumped me in the middle of a frat party. They promised that we would stick together all night, but jumped at the first chance to fool around with someone in the popular crowd. I waited for them for two hours while a bunch of drunk assholes hit on me when he finally approached me. Michael looked straight into my eyes. He politely introduced himself and made small talk for a few moments. He spoke almost in a whisper, but his eyes never left mine. After a while, he left. It was a pleasure talking to you, Jennifer. I'd like to take you out for coffee sometime. Here's my name and phone number if you're interested. Thank you for talking to me. It was the highlight of my semester. Admittedly, I almost didn't call him. I waited a little over a week before I decided what to do. We met for a cup of coffee. He asked me all sorts of questions. I found him very easy to talk to. It was during that first conversation that I realized what made him unique. Outwardly, he was quiet and unassuming. He wasn't bad looking. Perhaps he was even a little handsome. But he was brilliant. That much was obvious. He could talk about any topic and was well-versed in all the questions I asked him. He said he was studying computer science, but obviously he could have chosen any other major. We started talking about my subjects, especially the ones I had trouble with, particularly ancient philosophy. I was majoring in business and advertising. Unfortunately, I had put off a few of my least favorite electives, and I was having a little more difficulty than I had hoped. Michael's eyes never took his eyes off of me. Just like our first meeting, he looked me straight in the eye the entire time we were talking. His motive was clear. He was genuinely interested in me as a person. I was flattered. He suggested we study together in the student union or in the library. 
So three days later we were together again. I wouldn't call it studying. I'd rather call it advanced tutoring. Michael spent three hours in the library on Friday night, giving me the help I needed to do well on my philosophy exam. When I didn't understand something, he would apologize for his teaching methods and try something different. He was so patient. He never made me feel stupid when I didn't understand something. I could feel his excitement on the phone when I called him to tell him I passed the exam the following Tuesday. I could tell he was proud of me. He accepted no praise for helping me, saying that he was actually being selfish in trying to spend time with me and that it was the most enjoyable time he had spent on campus. I also learned about how Michael was different from the other guys. During the week, he was solely focused on his studies. There were no parties, no drinking, nothing that could be considered a distraction. At first, I was annoyed by it. But then it started to annoy me. For the next few weeks, we didn't go on any dates that I would call real, but he called every day just to talk to me and see how I was doing. He would leave me notes to let me know he was thinking about me. We still met for coffee or at the library, and once or twice we had lunch together. When we were together, he continued to ask questions about me and my family, my interests and dreams. If I asked him questions, he was open and honest. One day I asked him if he was afraid of anything. It was my favorite dating question. I read in a magazine that this question helps you understand how much a person trusts you. I was prepared for the typical bro answers. In the past, they ranged from nothing to that I'd leave college without a proper date. Michael just sat silently for a minute, staring into space. Then he looked me in the eye and said, I'm afraid I won't be a good father. I was an only child. My mother and father died when I was in high school, but we were never very close. I lived with my uncle until I graduated high school. He was a womanizer and we had very little in common. I think he was relieved when I left for college. I want to get married. I want kids. But I don't have the experience of living in a loving, supportive family. I want to be a good father, but I'm afraid I don't know how. When he fell silent, I think he was looking for some kind of answer. Too much? He asked. No, Michael. Not too much. Just enough. About four weeks into our relationship, Michael asked if I had Saturday free. I replied that I was, and he said he would stop by the sorority at lunchtime. The days leading up to that Saturday were strange. I kept asking Michael what he was planning. He wouldn't tell me. My sorority sisters kept smiling at me and whispering. I was on edge when he finally arrived. He was dressed in maroon and sky blue clothes. His three fraternity brothers were similarly dressed and were carrying a large cooler and two huge trays of food. Michael held a DVD in one hand and a West Ham jersey for me in the other, and a smile shone on his face. He asked me to show him the big room of the house. When we turned the corner, most of the house was dressed in West Ham colors and started chanting. I was shocked. Once for maybe 30 seconds, I complained about missing my family's trip to England. I had a distant cousin who made the club team, West Ham United, and my family had planned a trip to London to see him play. Unfortunately, the trip fell on a very important test week for me, and I was unable to go. I was very disappointed and shared this with Michael. He asked a friend at a local sports bar to record the West Ham game by satellite. He studied the team chants, taught them to his friends and my sorority sisters, and watched the game so he knew when to start them. He and his friends brought several cases of English ale and cooked fish and chips. As the game went on, we sang, drank, and cheered. In the 72nd minute, he silenced everyone and told me to pay attention to the screen. I was able to see my cousin score his first Premier League goal, delayed recording, of course. No one else in my family could have said that. It was the nicest thing anyone has ever done for me. When it was over, he and his friends cleaned up after themselves and hit the road. Michael said he would call me later. I was left alone to fight off the taunts about the dreamy look in my eyes. It was worth it. Our phone conversations, notes, and coffee continued for a couple more weeks until one day, while sipping a latte, I noticed he looked extremely nervous. Everything okay, Michael? What? Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course it is. I was just wondering if you had any plans for Friday night. And if you're free, if you'd like to have dinner with me. You know, like a date? With me. Friday night. I'd love to have dinner with you, Michael. The look of relief on his face was surprising. It was quickly replaced by one of the widest smiles I'd ever seen. It was on his face as he finished his coffee, as we walked out the door, and as he turned around to give me one last wave as he walked to class. I could see him almost a block away. 
From that moment on, everything around me was a perfect whirlwind of love, romance, and friendship. I did better in school than I ever had before. I was having more fun than I ever had in my life. People started treating me differently, too. I was more comfortable being myself, the woman Michael loved, and I think people were attracted to that. I will say that being around Michael was like getting daily vitamins for the ego. He may have always sold himself, but he was never shy about describing me in the best terms. In fact, it was probably just the opposite. Michael was a pretty good-looking guy who was fit, if not a little athletic. He was always well-groomed, bordering on classy. He was pleasant to be around and liked everyone, but was a little shy around new people. I could say without a doubt that he was always the smartest person in the room, including the professors, and everyone knew it. But with a casual demeanor, he avoided the limelight and attention to spend time with me. He often told me he was just a regular guy who won the lottery when he met me. I would describe myself as pretty. My friends described me as cute. My family described me as cute. I was always a little self-conscious about my looks and my body. It was hard not to be. Some of my sorority sisters were gorgeous, with model looks and matching bikini bodies. But it was hard not to feel like I possessed something special when looking at myself through Michael's eyes. I could tell that the longer I was with Michael, the more valuable I felt. I was over the moon when it was time for prom. One of the silly end-of-year sorority rituals was playing potential husband. Being one of the few sisters without a long-term boyfriend, I was never able to partake in it. It was a favorite event for a large group of alumni, and it was always well attended. It was simple enough. Each sister would come out alone in front of the assembled alumni and could give a positive or negative example of another sister's boyfriend from the past year. The sister whose boyfriend received the most positive comments won. I can't say I was completely shocked by the result, but I was a little shocked. For the first time in the 29-year history of this event, my Michael received all positive feedback. One from each sister. I had never felt so proud and was a little disappointed that traditionally I wouldn't be able to let him know he had won. Three days later, I did find a way to reward him. The day after graduation, Michael drove me home. I was originally from Chicago, and Michael had been offered a job there. We spent four hours on the road holding hands and talking. We stopped for a quick breakfast and a kiss. We arrived at my childhood home just before lunch. Michael spent the next two hours charming my parents. I was a little surprised when he asked if he could buy my dad a beer. They left before I could even object. My mom smiled through misty eyes. Oh, Jennifer, this one's a keeper. Trust me, Mom. I know. Michael and Dad smiled and laughed all the way to the front door when they finally returned two hours later. Michael told me he'd be back to pick me up for dinner after he checked into the hotel, said a quick goodbye to my parents, and left. Last thing he told me was that he had asked my father for permission to marry me. That night I'll never forget. It was magical. After a wonderfully romantic Italian dinner, Michael proposed to me on the deck of Willis Tower. It was a beautiful clear evening, and the lights of the Chicago skyline almost matched the glow in my heart. Being a virgin in college always caused mild embarrassment. I'm sure I was the only sister from the sorority left in the house. But that night it was a precious gift. Part of the matching set. Michael gave himself to me that night. I could feel it. He was patient, loving, and tender. I couldn't have dreamed of a more perfect contact. I asked him where he'd learned to be such a fantastic lover. Modest as ever, he whispered. I read. Very much. Our life was damn near perfect. Right after graduation, Michael landed a good job. He was constantly being promoted, and I was happier than ever. I don't want to say that these years understate their importance to me. I can't find the words to express how happy I was in our first decade together. I wouldn't be able to describe how having children added to my life. I don't share the details of those years because they have nothing to do with my downfall. In fact, telling you about those years would only confuse you about the motivations that led to my fall. I know what my mistakes know, better said mistakes. I know why I fell. I didn't trust Michael enough. What I loved most about Michael was that he never hid his vulnerability from me. He shared his whole being with me and, more importantly, his insecurities. He never hid from me. For a long time, I had nothing to hide. My life was a fairy tale. My family was wonderful. Michael never treated me any differently than a full partner. I was involved in every decision that affected our lives. It didn't matter that he made five times as much as me or had a better handle on our finances. He always looked to me for advice and approval. 
Mostly it made me feel special, but sometimes I felt inadequate, like I wasn't holding up my end of the bargain. I never shared this with Michael. If I had shared it, I never would have ruined my life. He would have helped me. I know that. He loved me so much. He would have helped me feel whole. That tiny insecurity grew and grew over the years. Maybe it was budding. Whatever the case, by the time the kids went to school, I was lost in my own skin. I felt I needed something different, something that would give me an independent purpose. I wasn't looking for a lover by any means. I loved my husband. In the bedroom, I was more than satisfied. Our life was passionate, though maybe a bit of a drag. That was mostly my fault. I knew that my husband wanted to be a little more experimental, which is probably the right word, but I figured why spoil a good thing. No, I wanted to feel like an equal, not just to be treated as an equal. So I found a job and announced that I'd accepted it. I had it all figured out. I was fully prepared to defend my reasons for wanting the job. Our argument lasted four seconds. I think that sounds wonderful, Jennifer. Whatever makes you happy. And it worked. I solved my problem. On my own. I didn't need any help. The sheer vanity of my thoughts in those first few months made me sick afterward. But it was exciting at the time. I felt like I could go out into the world as an independent and confident woman. The mood in our office could be characterized as flirtatious. At worst, it could be described as a den of debauchery. My coworkers, both male and female, were young, brash, and energetic. There were a few inner office flings between them. There were no relationships. No one seemed to hide it or think there was anything wrong with it. My boss was probably the worst of the lot. Alan Henderson was a pretty good-looking guy, though not exactly my type. People were always teasing him, saying he couldn't keep a girl, and congratulating him on another conquest. I didn't rush into bed with the first guy who hit on me. In fact, I blew him off. Hard. But it made me wonder if Michael and I were missing something in our lives. Our group of friends was pretty low-key when it came to this. There wasn't a single conversation in our neighborhood that even came close to the daily barrage I heard at the office. After our first company Christmas party, when I introduced Alan to Michael, my life changed forever. I could tell they disliked each other, even though they pretended to get along just fine. I stopped talking to Michael about my work and never mentioned Alan. I could tell that my job and boss were bothering him. After that night, I noticed things had changed in the office as well. Alan started paying a lot of attention to me, praising my work in public and asking how I was feeling. He started asking me to share lunch with him. We always had long discussions about our latest project. He started asking my opinion more and more often. Then he would ask a few personal questions and we would end the conversation and get back to work. He also started complimenting me on my looks. In hindsight, I can say that he worked on me for months and I absorbed him like a fool. I don't remember the exact series of events that led up to this. It is with the deepest regret that I admit I enjoyed every minute of it. Alan's skillful seduction made me feel desirable. Emotions that I thought were long gone. Years later, analyzing my behavior, I realized the depth of my betrayal. I didn't feel Michael desired me because I didn't give him anything to desire. I knew the kind of man he was. He would never do anything that would make me feel uncomfortable. I was his true partner and cherished lover, not his girlfriend for fun. But he was very perceptive. The slightest hint on my part would be enough. Any hint that I wanted something else would have had dramatic consequences. A painful analysis of my married life revealed that Michael was obviously gingerly fumbling for any opportunity to energize our lives, and I was ignoring him. I am terribly ashamed to admit that I did all this and more for Alan. It turns out I was a whore to him. I got too deep into my relationship with Alan before I realized the truth. I gave Alan me for his birthday. The contrast with Michael was striking and changed my thinking almost immediately. Alan didn't love me and I was making a terrible mistake. I told Alan that our affair was over the very next day. He laughed and pushed me out of his office. The package was on my desk when I returned from lunch, along with a note to be in Alan's office at half past five. The contents of the package guaranteed my fulfillment. The pictures of Alan became a lock that chained me to him and the hell my life would become for the next year and a half and beyond. Having fun with my two coworkers who were waiting for me in Alan's office was very pleasant compared to what I would have to do during those 18 months. Let me just say that I was the company whore and Alan was my pimp and I hated him almost as much as I hated myself. I tried my hardest to find a way out and kept failing. 
It was only when I could no longer accept the immorality of my actions that the solution to my problems came by itself. When I was asked to entertain a weirdo guy in a conference room full of people, I realized I'd had enough. I had found the solution that had eluded me for so long. Courage. I told Alan I'd had enough, and I didn't care who he showed the pictures to. He just laughed and it was over. I felt so stupid. I have to say that when I woke up from my nightmare, I was surprised at the state of our house. Michael and the kids seemed to be doing just fine without me. In the back of my mind, I thought they would have a hard time facing life under the kind of neglect I had imposed on them. But it turned out to be exactly the opposite. It seemed as if I wasn't needed at all. Michael was clearly on top of things. He had a new car, new clothes, and looked like a successful executive. I felt terrible when I realized how long I had neglected my family. I decided right then and there that I would rededicate my life to them and do everything I could to make amends for my betrayal. But a distance had formed between us that had never been there before. I often wondered how long it had lasted. Michael never raised his voice to me. We never fought, but he treated me like an intruder. I decided I needed to put my best foot forward. I tried to seduce him. Hence, nothing worked. He barely touched me. After a few months, I looked at the state of our marriage. No intimacy, no communication. I decided I couldn't live like this. I suggested marriage counseling. Then Michael stopped talking to me. I don't mean he stopped trusting me. He just stopped talking. Not a word for weeks. I was on edge when my birthday came around. I let myself get a little worried. After all, he couldn't ignore me on my birthday. God, how wrong I was. When I got home from work, I was ready to find out what my family had planned, but found the house empty. The only thing on the dining room table was a small wrapped box. I realized what it was before I even opened it. A few years earlier, I had forgotten Michael's birthday. In a panic, I found an inexpensive watch at a store on a nearby street. I intended to rectify my oversight later, but I never did and eventually forgot about it. My gift was a mistake, but his gift was calculated. By the time I went to bed, I was furious. Keeping the kids away from me on my birthday was just cruel. I couldn't believe he had done that to me. And the gift. That was out of line. I should have realized something was terribly wrong. The symbolism should have been enough. Michael was not an evil man. He was the most gentle, caring, and loving person I had ever met. If I hadn't been so clouded with anger over that damned gift, I could have saved my marriage. If I had confessed my sins and asked for forgiveness, maybe there would have been hope for me. Unfortunately, at that point, I stopped thinking about working on my marriage and started thinking about divorce. I was sad, but I was determined. It took me a few weeks to work out all the details with my attorney. I told her about how Michael was aloof and even abusive, how he kept the kids away from me, how he ignored my request to go to counseling, how he stopped talking to me. My attorney pounced on my comments. She said I would be well compensated. We went over the claim. I felt I was doing what was fair, but standing up for what I needed to live a normal life. All that was left was to deliver the bad news. I stood silently in the doorway of the den and looked at the man who had once been my husband, my other half. He looked like the same man, but it wasn't him. Finally, I had had enough. Michael, I want a divorce. There was a long silence, but I didn't see any emotion on his face. I thought he smiled, but he was probably just in shock. He must have been, because his reaction wasn't what I expected. No yelling, no questions. Okay? And that was it. The following Friday, he was served with my divorce petition. That weekend, Michael was in a better mood. But if he tried to correct his recent behavior, it was too late. I was in no mood for reconciliation. He even said goodbye to me at the door as I left for work Monday morning. Too little, too late, I thought. When I got to the office, I realized there was a big problem, but I had no idea what it was. My boss, the president of the company, and our corporate lawyer were bickering in the conference room. Fists full of papers were being waved around. I was so busy watching the hysteria that I didn't notice the man waiting for me near my workstation. He caught me off guard when he spoke. Jennifer Smith? Yes. You're being served. The man handed me a massive envelope took my picture and left. I didn't even get a chance to sit down, let alone look at the contents of the envelope. As soon as the man left, the security guard and the human resources manager stood in front of me. Mrs. Smith, 
You are suspended pending an investigation on charges of inappropriate behavior in the workplace. Please gather your personal belongings and leave the building, she said. It was humiliating to have to gather my belongings while my coworkers looked on. It was even worse when I was escorted out of the building. I had no idea what was going on. I barely had time to pull out of the parking lot when my phone rang. It was my lawyer. Before I could even say hello, she had already let me out. Withholding important information and making her look like an idiot were the only phrases that made sense. I drove home in silence. When I arrived, the house was empty again. I had no idea what hell I had unleashed until I finally calmed down enough to remember the envelope. Michael's counterpetition was crushing. Almost all of my extramarital affairs were documented. There was no money. He had spent almost all of our savings. The word that hit me the hardest was adultery. I thought it couldn't get any worse. Then I tried calling my parents. I needed support. My father called me a whore and hung up on me. He didn't need to explain to me why he thought that. I already knew. The next seven days seemed like the loneliest of my life, but years later I would remember them fondly as the good days. Michael left a note, which I found later, saying he had taken the kids camping and would be back on Sunday. That first night, my older friend Rebecca called around 7 o'clock to see how I was doing. She said that Michael had sent her a DVD and that I didn't want to know what was on it. Over the next few days, my attorney detailed the hopelessness of my situation. I was being fired for cause. My company, several clients, and all of my partners were being sued. I would lose custody of my children. I would lose everything. At that moment, I was willing to do anything to get Michael to stop all the litigation. I tried to prepare myself for his return. Unfortunately, I couldn't stop crying. When the family came home, I was a mess. The kids walked past me as if I wasn't even in the room. Michael walked in a few minutes later, beer in hand, looking like he didn't give a damn. I barely forced myself to speak. You're going to ruin me. The pure hatred in his voice destroyed me. God, I hope so. When I tried to broach the subject of our history as husband and wife, he called me a whore. At that point, I wasn't even talking to him. I was just thinking out loud. But Michael launched into a tirade that lasted several minutes. Whore. Whore. Cunt. Bitch. Every word tore at me. I came. Then he got up and left the room. I can honestly say that I didn't give up. I tried to make things work with Michael. But he wouldn't talk to me. I wondered how Michael and the kids were doing without money. But it seemed to be okay. Sometimes I would sneak to watch him drop them off or pick them up from school. I couldn't get a job and was receiving unemployment benefits. My parents wouldn't talk to me. I needed somewhere to live and I started going from friend to friend, mostly divorced men. No one wanted to keep me for long. One day everything was fine and the next day they wanted me gone. On the advice of my lawyer, I started seeing a therapist. She believed that if I repented of my behavior and tried to get professional help on my own, it would help me in court. I had very little hope. I was able to work through some things, most of which I have shared with you. But the best advice my therapist gave me was at the end of our sessions. Her advice was to run far, far away. I don't know exactly why he decided to respond to me. It could have been a phone call, an email, or even one of the dozens of letters I sent. But for whatever reason, I came home and found a package from Michael waiting for me. I immediately recognized the store's standard gift box. The card was addressed to me in a rather vulgar manner. I understood everything. He knew almost everything. He really hated me and had a very specific suggestion on how I could best utilize my time. I don't know why the realization that he knew about my willing betrayal was so much worse. But it was. I cried. Hard. At the time, I was staying with a friend of a friend of a friend. A decent guy named Robert. I think he wanted our relationship to be more than just a roommate thing. When he came into the room to see what was up, I realized he had been drinking. When he saw the package, he became furious and sprinted out the door before I could stop him. I was worried when Robert wasn't home a few hours later. I should have been. The nurses at the hospital weren't verbose, but they knew most of the story. Apparently, Robert had gone to confront Michael. Michael had nearly beaten him to death. His face was mangled. He had a concussion, several internal injuries, and a shattered left hip. I was terrified. My problems were now infecting those around me. At my next session, I told this story to my therapist. She started asking me questions about Michael. I told her everything I knew. 
He was an only child. He had no family. He was orphaned when he was a teenager. I told her about our young love, his devotion to me and the children. I told her about his actions during the two years when he should have known about my infidelity and subsequent behavior. And I told her about what Michael had done to Robert. When I finished, she looked terrified. You have to run as far away from here as you can. Leave him alone. Don't call him. Don't write to him. Don't let him know where you are. There is no hope of reconciliation. Don't even try. Move on. If you push him, the most likely outcome is that he will kill you. Your actions have clearly broken a man with a fragile grip on sanity. He's endured disappointment after disappointment all his life. He will never forgive you. He will never forget. Run. And I ran. I ran away from the memories of my perfect life to a shitty college town in Virginia, where I found an even shittier job. A few years later, I found a man who could tolerate me and ignore my past. The best thing I can say about him is that he didn't smell or hit me. There was no love between us, just a friendly relationship. I'm sure that was part of my punishment. My children contacted me when they were older, just to say hello and let me know they were alive and knew I was too. They never asked to see me or play any meaningful role in their lives. Michael thrived without me. I followed his news as much as I could. He was always a superstar in the software industry and had the vast fortune to prove it. There was hardly anything written about his personal life. I saw him one more time at my daughter's wedding. I was surprised that I was invited. He looked amazing. He looked like the man who owned my heart and whom I had betrayed. I'll admit, I was a little startled when he approached me for his final gloat. For the record, you ruined my life first. He stared at my pathetic wedding ring. At that moment, I regretted never wearing it on my finger. I'm glad you found someone. I hope he makes you happy. And then he was gone. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.